Gong Jing Da Da San Ting Wei Su Pa Wei Chi Yi Jie Zhong San Jing Zhuan Miao Fa Lun Zhao Dao Wo Man Ru He Liao Shang Tuo Si Li Ku Da La Su Zhan Wu Shan. Will the Sangha with great virtue out of compassion for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering and attain bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize non-birth. <clears throat> Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambu tasa. Homage to the blessed, noble and perfectly enlightened one. Namo sadanto sucheto ye alahati san miao san puto che. Wu Shang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Zhao Yi Wo Jin Jian Wen De So Chu Yan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a billion eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Buddha's Bodhisattvas, Remember Master and all good knowing advisors. Welcome back to uh, class 84. Today we are st still um, on the theme of Lord Chakra and the heaven of the 33. And I have an amazing story told by Shofu um, about what goes on in the heavens, uh, particularly in the heavens of the 33. And uh, there's, I found some facts that most people know about this story. I'm going to keep it a surprise, a mystery until uh, we begin. Um, but I found, how you say, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's a little known fact, but I have not come across it until um, I was doing the work for, for today's class. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, it's, it's a very little little known fact okay uh, let's recite medicine master buddha's name seven times first namo quelling disasters lending life medicine master buddha namo quelling disasters lending life Medicine Master Buddha Namo Quelling disasters, lending life Medicine Master Buddha Namo Quelling disasters, lending life Me this and master Buddha Namo quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine master Buddha Namo quelling disasters, lending life. Medicine Master Buddha Na Amo Quelling Disasters Lending Life Medicine Master Buddha Medicine Master Does Come One Medicine Master Does Come One Medicine Master does come one. Medicine Master does come one. That's our title page. 
Okay, let's move on. Uh, we are going to begin today with a very famous sutra uh, called the Saka Panha Sutra. This sutra is named after Lord Chakra because it's a quest. It's a sutra about Lord Chakra's questions uh, to the Buddha. And we are. Uh, I'm just going to present a very short uh, version of the sutra because this sutra is pretty long. Um, if I think I shared. Uh, a story a few few classes back about how Lord Chakra wanted to see the Buddha but uh, because Lord Chakra isn't a very how you say uh, he's not very um, he's not a very important figure uh, in terms of uh, Buddhist cosmology compared to the other gods and the Bodhisattvas and because of his respect for the Buddha when he always finds a very appropriate time to see the Buddha and he's very af he doesn't he doesn't want to disturb the Buddha's peace and so this sutra actually starts out by he, uh, Lord Chakra ha uh, having a plan he draws up a plan on how to get the Buddha to, to on a very skillful way to see the Buddha and what he does is he, he gets one of his friends who's a Gandrava who's uh, who plays uh, music, one of the celestial musicians. And he goes with his friend and the Buddha is sitting, I think, in Samadhi. And uh, they uh, they find a distance not too near the Buddha, not to disturb the Buddha, but not too far away either. And then the musician plays his uh, music and he starts singing a song and uh, gently to how you say, to, to, to get the Buddha's attention and the Buddha starts speaking to the musician, praising him for his uh, uh, song making, his musical skills. And then uh, Lord Shaka finds the right time at this moment to then uh, say hello, introduce, uh, to, to, to tell the Buddha he's around and ask the Buddha if he was uh, available, uh, free for him to ask questions. And then uh, this was when I also said that when Lord Chakra was around that the area of the Buddha, all the village villagers thought that the area was on fire because Lord Chakra, being a god, uh, emits light, and uh, all they saw was the the bright light, and they thought that the place was on fire. So that's how the sutra begins, and then Lord Chakra is able to ask his questions. It's very interesting. So if you want to look up the whole sutra, uh, it's called the Saka Panha uh, Sutra. The num you can find it in the Digaya, Diga Nikaya collection. DN uh, is number twenty one. Okay, so um, okay, we'll dive into the sutra. Oh, today's theme, by the way, is false thinking. Okay, see if you can spot the theme of false thinking throughout uh, our our slides for today. So Lord Chakra asked the Buddha for permission to ask questions, and the Buddha said, "Yes, you may." So he asked the first question, he said, By what fetters, sir, are beings bound? Gods, humans, asuras, nagas, uh, here is, is, is uh, spelled as Gandabas. We are more familiar with the Sanskrit spelling of Gandharas. These are the celestial musicians. It says, And whatever other kinds there may be, whereby although they wish to live without hate, harming, hostility, or malignity, and in peace, yet, they live, uh, they yet live in hate, harming one another, hostile and malign, meaning all living beings, uh, including us. We want our lives to be peaceful, to be prosperous, to have no one harming us or, or cheating us, to have no one harboring ill will uh, towards us. And, you know, he says, by, but why do we live our lives that way? So he says, what what bounds us? What's another way to explain bound? What what is it that makes life for us this way? Yeah, we, uh, life is not very peaceful for for most of us. What traps us? Uh, what traps us in this um, nature of of existence? Okay, then the Buddha answered, he said, "Ruler of the gods." So that's uh, one of Lord Chakra's uh, uh, title. Uh, Ron, so uh, when you asked just now, so ruler of the gods, it is the bonds of jealousy and avarice 
that bind beings so that though they wish to live without hate, harming, hostility or malignity and in peace, yet they yet live in hate, harming one another, hostile and malign. So what's the word? There's a word there, jealousy and avarice. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that properly, avarice. Uh, it means greed or desire, usually of an extreme kind. Uh, for example, something that pushes you to steal something or pushes you to harm another living being. Um, for example, like greed for food. It blinds us to the act to the repercussions of our actions on other living animals, for example. Why? Because uh, it tastes good and we don't want to think too much about uh, the, 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 uh, the choices, the, the consequences of the actions that we, that we take. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the problem with, with desire, um, avarice is that ev desire cannot be satisfied. It is a, a feature huh, of uh, samsaric existence that we can never find everlasting um, satisfaction. We may find it in for a short while, very temporary, um, but the moment it is satisfied, the feeling quickly fades because uh, it, it's, everything is conditioned by impermanence. And after a while, we have the desire again to, to get satisfied. And then we try again to want to go back. Yeah. All right. Okay. So then Lord Chakra asks another question and say, but sir, meaning the Buddha, he says, what gives rise to jealousy and avarice? He's trying to find the root of the cause. He says, what is the origin? How are they born? How do they arise? Owing to the presence of what do they arose? Owing to the absence of what do they arise? And then the Buddha answers, jealousy and avarice, ruler of the gods, take rise from like and dislike. This is their origin. This is how they are born, how they arose. When these are not present, they arise. When these are absent, they do not arise. So uh, it's interesting um, because in the next slide, Lord Chakra asks again. Uh, okay, maybe I'll just advance to the next slide. Okay, so before I do that, the 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 uh, let me go back one slide. Okay, so the Buddha answers Shak Lord Chakra's first question that jealousy and desire is the cause of the all the suffering and affliction in our world that we, that we experience. Okay. Uh, jealousy and desire. Then Lord Chakra asks what's behind jealousy and desire. And then the Buddha says, Oh, uh, when you have like and dislike, we, there are things that we discriminate in our feelings, in our emo emotions towards things. We, uh, we like certain things. We don't like certain things. And that discrimination is behind jealousy and desire. Okay, because uh, that's how we divide the world, the things that we uh, experience. So Lord Chakra is not satisfied because there's more. So he asks again, what is the source? What's behind like and dislike? So um, it's kind of like a child asking a parent, you know, when they ask you a question, there's a phase that a child go goes through. I don't know what that age is, but there's a, I know there's kind of like an age where they, they, they ask never ending questions and uh, it tends to drive people crazy. They say, why? So why, why, why? <laughs> so that's kind of like what Lord Chakra is doing. <laughs> Asking the Buddha again, what is the source of like and dislike? Okay. And then the Buddha says desire. Desire is the source of what is like and dislike. The moment we have uh, a feeling about something, uh, then it gets categorized into whether we like it, we want more, or we don't like it. There's a third category too that is uh, makes us indifferent. Whether we have more or less, we don't really care. Uh, so desire is the source of what is like and dislike. Then Lord Chakra asks again, predictably, he says, what is the source of desire? What's behind desire? And then here the Buddha reveals, he says, thought is the source of desire. So uh, the, the thoughts that arise from a false thinking mind. And then, Lord Chakra again asks, what is the source of thought? 
Then the Buddha says, thinking arises from the tendency to pro proliferation. What's proliferation? Pro pro proliferation, the technical word is papancha in Pali. It just means false thinking. Shufu always used the word false thinking, false thinking. What is false thinking? Uh, the official um, or the technical term in Pali is papancha or uh, usually translated in English through proliferation. That means from one, um, pro proliferate means it, it, it branches out into, into many, many uh, branches. Okay, so proliferation says when this tendency is present, thinking arises. When it is absent, thinking does not arise. So we have jealousy and greed, which causes all the, the all the misery of of uh, of our lives, and not just us, other living beings as well. Uh, it talks about the gods, uh, the asuras, the gandravas. Is caused by jealousy and greed. What causes jealousy and greed? Like and dislike. Okay. What causes like and dislike? And dislike, desire. What causes desire? Thoughts. Okay, our thoughts. And where do our thoughts come from? Come from the root is false thinking. Okay, so that's the um, 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 uh, the essence of this sutra called the Sakapanha Sutra. And this is where we're going to end at this sutra. But the the sutra itself goes on for for uh, for quite a, a a a long portion more. Uh, part of it is that the, the Buddha explains how does someone who practices reduce false thinking and then the Buddha outlines a whole formula where the Buddha says there are two kinds of happiness because what beings want is happiness, right? So the Buddha outlines two kinds of happiness but he outlines a very skillful way where he says that one kind of happiness um, brings forth unwholesome factors. So that's, for example, uh, greed. We want something, and we do what we want. We do what we, um, we do what we can to obtain what we want. That may bring a temporary form of happiness, but it comes from it. It uh, it, it comes from unwholesome factors, and it gives rise to more unwholesome factors. The Buddha says that that kind of happiness is not to be pursued. It's not to be investigated. It's not to be pursued. It's to be put down. And then the Buddha says there's another kind of happiness that leads to wholesome tendencies. So, for example, uh, say practicing generosity, for example, uh, where you learn to share, especially the things that are your favorite, and you find that, oh, when you help people, um, you feel good. There's a sense of uh, happiness that comes from, from within yourself. And then when you try to, say, meditate or recite the Buddha's name, you find that, oh, that happiness actually calms the mind down. You know, when you buy a new car, for example, or you get a new house, or you get into a new relationship, you, f you think that you're happy, but that form of happiness, you realize it, you can't really do something as simple as recite the Buddha's name. Your mind is vibrating too much. So the Buddha says that's kind of an unwholesome kind of happiness. So it says if you want to progress on the path, you have to examine yourself and um, nurture the kind of happiness that leads to wholesome, uh, that has wholesome roots and leads to a wholesome outcome and be aware and be careful of the other kind of happiness um, and adjust yourself accordingly. He doesn't say it's bad, it just says you have to be aware depending on your intentions of your practice. So that's the remainder of, uh, of this sutra. Okay, uh, at this moment, do we have, I know Ron has a question. Does anyone else has, else has any questions? Ron, you can ask your question while, you know, anyone else who has, they can think about it. Is Ron there? Yeah, this is kind of like uh, maybe a little bit off track, but um, since Chakra, he's a Dharma protector, right? Yes. So, you know, um, so I'm, I'm wondering why, you know, like in Christianity, they don't know anything about cause and effect or am I, am I wrong in that statement? 
Wow, what does that have to do with Lord Chakra? Well, you know, since he was, since he is the, the Lord of the gods, I mean, you know, he's God and then... Uh, oh, okay, but, but Lord Chakra is not responsible for Christianity? Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so, so basically the, um, the, the gods that the monotheistic religions pray to within Buddhist cosmology, that god is Lord Chakra. But whether Lord Chakra came down to earth and and um, uh, created or, or taught the teachings of Christianity, that's a whole different thing. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. I, I, Sorry I, about I, that. I, yeah. No, that's a that's a good question. But uh, 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 Christianity wasn't uh, spread by Chakra. Yeah. I don't think he even knew. Yeah. Let's put it this way. There's a, I have an answer for that question, but I don't think uh, we should explore that today. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, uh, let's move on. What I have next is something called Chakra's Battle. Okay, this is the famous battle that happens at the, in the heavens of the 33. And there are, very, there are many variations about this story. Um, uh, but this is the classic battle that happens between the gods of the 33 and the Asuras. And one of the battles, um, before going into this particular uh, version, which was told to us by Shufu, when Shufu was explaining the Lotus Sutra. So this is from Shufu's commentary in the Lotus Sutra. One of the versions that we have uh, is that the gods of the heaven of 33 when the the heaven was formed, they went to the heaven. Um, I don't know the the backstory about that, but that's how the story begins. And they found the asuras were already there. And what happened was they tricked the asuras by giving them a heavenly beer, something like heavenly beer that make them intoxicated. And then they threw the when the asuras drank and drank and drank until they got drunk, and the gods didn't drink because that was their plan. The asuras all got drunk. Uh, all slept and as they were sleeping the gods threw them out of the heaven of the 33 and then they landed in a place uh, uh, on Mount Sumeru that is kind of like an identical version of the the heaven and they didn't realize they were thrown out of the heaven until later when uh, they saw certain things were different something like that is very complicated and then they the, the Asuras <clears throat> got very upset because, you know, they got thrown out from their home. And then that's how they created war with the, uh, with the gods of the heaven of 33. And it's, it's kind of like a never, never ending battle. Yeah. Okay. So this, uh, this is a slightly different version told by Shufu. Okay. So it starts with the Asura King Womachitrin or some known also as Vepachiti who had a very beautiful daughter named Sachi uh, to whom Chakra, the Jade Emperor, became engaged. Okay, so these are the ongoings of, uh, uh, if there was a TV show, what, there's a show called um, something Real Housewives of Beverly Hills or, you know, that kind of TV show. If this, if there was a reality show, um, uh, Real Gods of the Trim Trimsha Heaven, uh, this would be one of the the, the dramas that, that goes on. So the Asura king had a very beautiful daughter who got engaged and married to Lord Chakra, uh, the Jade Emperor. Okay, so she would say, why did he want to marry her? The Jade Emperor still has a body with thoughts of desire. They have physical bodies, the, the gods in this heaven. Because he has not severe thoughts of sexual desire, he likes beautiful women. So one day, catching sight of the beautiful Asura girl, it is said that um, Asura women are one of the most beautiful living beings around. So it says one day, catching sight of the beautiful Asura girl, he became enamored of her and asked the Asura king for his daughter's hand in marriage. The Asura king thought the Jade Emperor has got a lot of power. I had best not cross him. So Vepachiti is uh, said to be the most senior of all the Asuras or the most powerful. That's why he's, uh, he rules over the Asuras. His name wasn't Vepachiti before. He used to be known as Sambara. And there's actually a sutra 
uh, called the Sam Samudaka Sutra, where the uh, Asuras were planning for for battle with the gods of the thirty three, and as they were getting ready for war, uh, because the place that they, they live in is on the shores, uh, somewhere on Mount Sumeru, and it's uh, I think it's it's on the northern shores of. Uh, Utarakuru, I, I, my memory is hazy, but I spoke of this before in one of the classes, and this is where the immortals like to live, uh, away from humans. So the immortals knew that they were getting ready for war, so they went to see this king uh, who was known as Sambara at the time, and told them, say, okay, we know you're going for war, but um, can you give us a guarantee that as you are fighting that you will not harm us the the immortal said and what uh sambara replied was he, he actually said no he said because uh you all have the support of lord chakra lord chakra supports immortals and people who practice the dharma he said you are wicked followers or partisans not followers you are wicked partisans that means you are same party of chakra and say instead of giving you safety i will only give you fear so the immortals then curse they said okay in this sutra he said they cursed sambara and left and after receiving the curse at night when he was sleeping this king of asuras uh got a, a, a experience uh, terrible nightmares three times during the night and uh, each time he 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 woke up screaming as they said as if he was struck by a hundred spears and his screams were so loud he was heard all over the, the realm of asuras and all his followers came and they were very concerned and asked him what happened and he says from that night onward he suffered from the sickness of a broken mind and was therefore given the name Vepachiti, which translates literally as broken mind. Okay, so that's some uh, useless information about uh, Vepachiti. Let's move on with Shufu's commentary. Um, so after they were married, the Jade Emperor liked to listen to an immortal speak Dharma. So in some versions, Shufu says the uh, Chakra would uh, listen to Dharma from the Buddha. In this version, it's an immortal. Because he went to the lectures every day, the Asura girl soon grew suspicious. He goes out every day and never gets home until late at night. Most likely, he's out playing around with other women. Finally, she confronted him. Just where do you go every day? You wouldn't be conducting some improper business on the side, would you? Okay, this, like I said, full of uh, drama. So according to Shufu, uh, women Asuras, well, they can be uh, they're very, very pretty. And at the same time, the men are very, very ugly. Uh, women Asuras are also very, very jealous. Okay. So, just like any good story or any good movie, they have flashbacks where they, um, they at a certain point in a movie, the story stops and then we get taken back in time to understand more about what is going on. That's what I'm going to take you on today to provide more context as to why Lord Chakra um, fell in love with his future wife and why his future wife is so jealous. Okay. And to that, we have to go to a Jataka tale, Jataka number 31. Uh, you find it in the Dhammapada as well. Um, so this explains the history of Chakra and his wife. Okay. So Sachi, which is this Asura princess, and Chakra were previously husband and wife in their previous birth. So before Chakra became Chakra, and before Sachi uh, was uh, his wife, uh, Asura princess, they were humans, human beings, and they were named Suja and Maga. So Suja was the lady, and Maga was uh, formerly Chakra. And Suja was one of Maga's four wives. Okay. Say, however, when Maga was born as Chakra, he was only accompanied by three of his former wives and Suja was missing. He investigated the matter and saw that she was now a crane living in the forest. Okay, so what happened was, um, there's another backstory to this. Um, how, uh, which is how Mega 
uh, became chakra maga sorry excuse me maga became chakra and because he did a lot of good deeds three of his wives uh, also performed good deeds alongside him except this particular asura princess who did not do anything so because she did not do anything and did not accrue any blessings or merit she was born as a crane instead so what did uh, lord chakra do he hatched a plan to be reun reunited with suja okay what plan did he do okay chakra took the bird meaning his former wife the crane to try and trim shy heaven so he had the ability to show this crane around in the heaven to let it see the pleasant state that was the result of marriage henceforth keep the five precepts he admonished the crane and instructed it on what those entail meaning he taught the crane about the precepts a little later to check up on the crane chakra assumed the form of a fish and lay without moving in in the pond the crane thought this one must be dead and took it up in his beak he wanted to eat the fish and uh, if the fish was dead he could the, the he could eat it when the fish began to wiggle it still she immediately let it go thinking it is alive after all so she didn't want to kill she wanted to maintain the precepts chakra said sadhu it is good that you are protecting your precepts and return to his abode so if you remember from last week time works kind of differently you remember that heavenly maiden who was picking flowers she died came was reborn as a girl a human girl a uh, lifespan was 100 years she made but because she remembered her wow uh, she, I'm sorry because she remembered her past life as a heavenly uh, goddess she made a vow to be reborn back in that very same life uh, so she spent every day of the 100 years trying to make as much merit and blessings as possible and after 100 years she died got reborn back her wish her vow got fulfilled her wish got fulfilled she got rebound back as the wife of the her ex her husband who she left in the heaven and no one really even knew that she died because it was still the same uh, morning so time kind of works very differently okay so uh, this was chakra's plan to get back his wife okay because he missed his wife although it was from a past life okay so after her death as a crane Suja was then born into a family of potters in Baranasi. There too, she kept the precepts. So from a crane, she did not become, uh, she, uh, she wasn't reborn in the heaven straight away. She was reborn as a, a human girl. Shakra came to her district in the form of an old peddler with a hard hand cut full of golden cucumbers. Okay, I'm not sure if these are cucumbers who are golden in color or they were actually cucumbers made of gold. So take my cucumbers, take my cucumbers, she shouted the, uh, this peddler. When the people offered to buy them, he said they were not for sale for any price, but free for one who keeps the precepts. So the people said, we don't know anything about any precepts. Who is this cucumber man anyway? said the people as they left the place. I guess they were frustrated. They couldn't buy the gold, uh, golden cucumbers. So the girl, Suja, heard of these strange cucumbers. I guess they were probably made of gold or valuable and thought, I keep the precepts. This must be for me. So Chakra asked her, do you got your precepts, my dear? And she answered, yes, father, I do. And so he said, then these are yours. And he pushed the card to her door and left. So he didn't even charge her. He just made a gift for her. So I guess there's a gap in the story. Um, I guess that once she had this valuable cucumber, she could create more merit, more blessings. Because at the end of that lifetime, she was reborn as the daughter of Vipachiti, king of the Asuras. Okay. And because of her previous virtue, she was endowed with a very with a very beautiful form. When she came of age to marry, Vepachiti announced that his daughter would choose her husband according to her own wishes, and he ordered all the Asuras to come to an assembly. So Chakra also appeared at the assembly, but he disguised himself in the form of an old Asura. Suja, the princess, was then led out beautifully adorned and, and asked to choose her husband by placing a garland around uh, her choose her chosen uh, husband you know that 
this is like the movies again. You know, there's always uh, there's always movies about how princesses they have to choose a husband either against their will or one of their choosing, and then all the eligible bachelors or prince prince princes from different territories all come together in the great big hall, right? Uh, I remember my I don't know the titles of the movie, but uh, I remember their movies that I watched. They are like this. Okay, moving on. Uh, so the girl, the princess, when her eyes saw sh lit on chakra because of their past life affection, meaning their affinities, the karma that they have created, her heart was flooded with a great love for him, washing through her like a wave, and she declared, this one is my husband. The hosts of young, powerful Asuras were abashed. That one is old enough to be her grandfather. So they, that's what they thought. Okay, so this is a great example of the power of affinities or karma that we create through our relationships uh, with, with everyone that we meet. So walking the path, as we learn more about Buddhism, we should be more aware that instead of creating relationships based on emotional on, on an emotional foundation, for example, the the relationship between Lord Chakra and his former wife and how that affection endured to the point that when she was reborn as a princess, even when Lord Chakra was in disguise, in front of her, immediately she fell in love with him. Although, you know, physically he was probably not the most outstanding because he, he disguised himself as an old Asura, but the the power of karma and affinities just made her fall in love instantly uh, with, with her former husband. So for us, that is a lesson in how if we continue building relationships based on emotions, how that those ties just bring us back again. Because when the emotions come back, uh, they are very, very powerful and it just creates more, um, more things to trap us within samsara. Remember the first sutra, uh, Lord Chakra is asking what are the things that trap human beings in this ex existence, living beings in this form of existence. This is, this is one example, the karma that we create through our relationships. So what is the alternative? Well, the alternative is to purify our relationships. So instead of basing our uh, relationships on emotions such as love, emotional love or hatred uh, or jealousy and all the other emotions that exist, we instead uh, for, use, for example, the vows of the Bodhisattva. When you come to, the, to a Mahayana temple, you always make the three vows, I vow, and one of them is I vow to save all living beings. What does that mean? It means that in our relationships, we do what is best for other people in order for them to walk the path. So we treat them with loving kindness, not with emotional love, which is based on, on possessiveness or jealousy, but we can treat them with um, loving kindness, which is a wish that they be happy. We always have their well-being in our mind and wish that they uh, can change habits from unwholesome to wholesome. So that's one example of purifying our uh, relationship karma and evolving where instead of emotional relationships blossoming, for example, like this, Lord Chakra and the uh, Princess, we have relationships that are uh, 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 how you say, for example, uh, Elder Master Xian, Xian Lao He Sang, when he was forced to marry uh, by his, was it his uncle or his parents? I think it was his uncle. Um, anyway, he was, Elder Master Xian was forced to marry as a very young man um, because he wanted to become a monk, but he was the only son. And not only the only son, he was the only uh, male in that generation. That means his uncles 
or his aunties did, his uncles did not have any sons as well. So if he had not had children, the family name would die, would end then and then. So I think it was uh, his uncle as well who forced him to marry and not marry just one, but two, two women became his wife. But his relationship with the women was very pure. In fact, all three of them were cultivators. And uh, before their marriage, they made an agreement where that they would not be like a regular husband and wife, but uh, practice would, the, 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 re the bonds of the relationship would be based on virtue and practice. So that's an example of the result of purifying our relationships. There are others where eminent monks, uh, for example, like Shufu, uh, upon his mother's death, he sat by his mother's grave uh, for three years. And Shufu explained that was a way of purifying um, the, the relationship. Yeah. Uh, so things like that, we, have, we, we can see the contrast between relationships based on emotional ties and the repercussions or the way it continues to bind us to our samsari existence or the result of purifying our relationships in state. Okay, so coming back to the story, she chose the old Asura and the young powerful Asuras in their prime were a bash. What's a bash? A bash means uh, kind of like a mixture, a mix of uncomfortable and a sh feeling ashamed. Why? Because Instead of choosing, uh, how you say, they felt that they were insulted because someone who was old uh, and probably more, even more ugly than a regular ugly Asura man uh, was chosen in favor of them. Yeah. So the ego gets hurt. All right. So taking Suja by the hand, Chakra revealed his Deva form and roared aloud, I am Chakra. <laughs> so he finally he was chosen. He rubbed, he, he rubbed salt into the wounds of the Asuras by revealing that he's actually their, kind of their enemy. So the Asuras were enraged. He said, we have been deceived by Ohu Chakra. They tried to seize him, but just at that moment, Matali, the charioteer, Matali is uh, uh, Chakra's driver. He drives Chakra's chariot. And this is not a normal chariot. This chariot is pulled by 1,000 uh, sin horses. I'm not sure what that means, but they're not uh, animals. They're actually uh, magical and, uh, horses. And that's how they escape. And, but they were hotly pursued by the host of angry Asuras. So this will actually make for a great movie. Okay, a lot of drama. Yeah. So as the chariot sped up the slopes of Mount Sumeru towards the city of the Devas, he entered the Sipa Livana. What's a Sipa Livana? A forest inhabited by many supanas. There was a great sound of heart-rending cries coming from below. What are supanas? If you remember, they are Garudas, the golden, the, the great, uh, the golden great wing bird. They are the ones with the lifespan, uh, not the lifespan, the wingspan, that a huge wingspan, several miles. And when they flap their wings, the oceans of the the, the water in the oceans get parted and they uh, that's how they can eat their food which is which are dragons okay that was a, we covered that a long time ago okay so anyway they went to this forest and uh, which was where the supanas live and they heard Lord Chakra heard uh, cries coming from below so he asked Matali he said what's that sound Matali said, my lord, it is the young of the supanas. Many of them are being destroyed by the passage of a chariot. So as they were traveling to the forest, they were harming the baby supanas. So Chakra was appalled and ordered Matali to stop the chariot at once. He, says it, he, he did know that he was harming as they were fleeing the asuras that uh, by going through the forest, he would harm the baby supanas. So then the Hasuras coming up behind saw that Chakra had stopped. They thought the reason must be that he was expecting reinforcements and in fear of a great Dewa army, they returned to the Asura city and hung their heads in shame. On their arrival in, in Tawan Timsa, Tawan Timsa here is spelled in the Pali um, version. Uh, it, so it's, it's also Triumph Trimsha. 
Chakra installed Suja as the chief of his 25 million acharas. So Chakra, as Lord Chakra, had 25 million, um, uh, you can say his concubine uh, was 25 million strong, and he put Suja as his main consort, his, the queen. So she said to him, Great king, here in the Deva world, I have no mother or father, no brother or sister. I would ask of you a boon. What's a boon? A boon is a favor or a, 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 to ask for a, a wish. Wherever you go, there I would go too. So Chakra made this promise saying Sadhu. So this is the background of the relationship. Okay, so this explains why when Lord Chakra went to listen to the Dharma and didn't bring his wife, that um, made his wife especially jealous. Why? Because Lord Chakra uh, promised the wife never to go anywhere without her. <laughs> okay, all right. So now we can go back to Shifu's commentary. The flashback is over. And now we go back to the main story. Okay, so Shufu says, after they were married, the Jade Emperor, meaning Chakra, liked to listen to an immortal speak Dharma. Okay, we've gone through this. This is the slide um, that the flashback happened. Okay, so did we stop where she confronted him. And then the Jade Emperor said, no, I go to the lectures on the sutras every day and that's why I'm always home late. You shouldn't be suspicious. She said, the Asura girl, not believing, not believing he was going to the Sutra lectures, decided he must certainly be up to no good. She had a certain amount of spiritual power and was able to make herself invisible. She could be standing in one spot and ordinary people with mortal eyes or even the Jade Emperor with his heavenly eyes couldn't see her. Okay, so she could, she could uh, make herself invisible. So one day when as usual, the great, the Jade Emperor got in his chariot and headed for the lecture. The Asura girl made herself invisible and rode along. Very sneaky. Upon arriving, the Jade Emperor got out of the chariot and so did the Asura girl. Then she materialized. What are you doing here? Asked the Jade Emperor in surprise. He says, what are you doing here? She snorted, looking around at the beautiful goddesses in the assembly. Lord Chakra said, I've come to listen to the lectures. And she replied, well, so have I. Okay, so she's creating a scene in front of the whole audience. So Shufu says, now the Jade Emperor is still a common mortal. He's not a certified sage by any means, and so he sometimes gets afflicted. This time he picked up his flower whip and lashed the Asura girl. Okay, so for those of you who are very, um, who have a good memory, might have heard me um, say that the Lord Chakra is a first stage Arhat or a stream enterer. Um, so that's described in, in different sutras. And probably Shufu said this because at this point in time, Lord Chakra was not a stream enterer yet. I don't know. Uh, that's, but that's my way of uh, uh, reconciling the information that we have. So Shufu says the Asura girl was furious and went directly to her father. Previously, when the Jade Emperor was about to be married, he had invited the Asura king to a banquet. As a gesture of respect to his new father-in-law, he sent out his generals and troops to welcome him. So that's how he sent out his wedding invitation. He sent his, uh, his generals and his troops. But, however, the Asura king was suspicious of the welcoming party. So in instead of feeling honored, he became suspicious. He said he felt intimidated and was displeased at the Jade Emperor's show of power. Okay, you see how uh, sometimes you want to do something good, but it turns out wrong. Okay. Now his daughter returned with a report that the Jade Emperor was not following the rules at all. Every day he goes out with other women, the Asura girl said. And today when I tried to talk to him about it, he struck me. Okay. So at this, the Asura king became enraged. Jade Emperor, he stormed, this means war. We are going to fight to the finish. So he has a, another excuse to start another war. And he mobilized the Asura troops against the, against the Jade Emperor. Strangely enough, the Jade Emperor lost battle after battle and could find no way to overcome the Asura king. So most stories that we have of the battles, the gods always win. They always triumph over the Asuras. 
But Shufu says in the beginning, that's not what happened, at least not for this incident, you know. So finally, Lord Chakra had no recourse, but he, so he, he went to the Buddha for help, okay. The Buddha told him to instruct his troops all to recite Maha Prashna Paramita. As they went into battle, they all recited the, the phrase Maha Prashna Paramita. That's what we recite in the Buddha Hall too. Especially at the end of the Sutra, um, the 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 Hat, uh, the Hat Sutra, yeah. And then the Asuras lost battle after battle until they had retreated as far as they could and were backed up into a lotus root. Shufu says lotus root. Other sutras uh, say it was the lotus uh, plant. Some say it's a lotus flower. And then why was the Shufu says why was the Asura king unable to withstand? Maha Prashna Paramita. Shufu says, it's very simple. Before the Jade Emperor's troops recited it, they would win a battle and then lose a battle. After they recited the phrase, the Buddha taught them, they won continuously. Previously, the Asuras and the heavenly troops had been more or less equal in strength. Neither side had any wisdom to speak of, and their battles were utterly chaotic. When the heavenly troops recited Maha Prashna Paramita, they gained Great wisdom, while the Asura still had none. When those without wisdom fight those with wisdom, they inevitably lose. So the Asuras were very stupid and the heavenly troops were very wise. When the wise battles against the stupid, sooner or later, the stupid one always loses. Such was the situation between the Asuras and the heavenly troops. So that's such a straightforward explanation by Shufu. Okay. So this comes to the end of Shufu's commentary on, on Chakra's battle. But as far as we are concerned, it's not the end because today's theme is on um, false thinking, right? Okay. So the incident of the Asura uh, army retreating into the lotus flower or into the lotus plant was actually witnessed by someone. Okay, and uh, the, the Buddha shared a sutra, to, and this sutra is called the Loka Cinta Sutta, translated to as contemplating the world. But Loka Cita, for those of you who speak uh, Malay or Indonesian, will realize that Loka means the world, and Cinta means love, loving the world. Okay, um, and uh, but in English we call it contemplating the world. Why? Because okay, the Buddha explains. He says this was when the, the Buddha was at Rajagaha in the bamboo grove, and the Buddha said, "Because once in the past, a certain man set out from Rajagaha and went to the Sumaga Sumagada Lotus Pond, thinking, I will ponder about the world. He then sat down on the bank of the Sumagada Lotus Pond, thinking about the world." In other words, false thinking. He wanted to contemplate the world. Okay, contemplate what? Okay, we'll find out. Then because the man saw a four division army entering a lotus stock on the bank of the pond. So imagine you see a whole army, okay, four division army. I'm not sure how big that is, but I'm guessing it's pretty big. You, and these are Asuras. Uh, so Asuras are kind of, they're, they're very huge. They're very, very tall. I don't have the figures with me right now, but they are, uh, if they match the heaven of the 33 gods, they are a few hundred miles in height. And even if they were just life size, like human size, if you saw a whole army disappear into a lotus plant, it, it kind of, of boggles the mind, you know? So that's what this poor man saw. And having seen this, he thought, I must be mad. I must be insane. Yeah, of course. I've seen something that doesn't exist in the world. The man returned to the city and informed a great cr crowd of people, I must be mad, sirs. I must be insane. I've seen something that doesn't exist in the world. It's kind of like, you know, the modern equivalent of seeing a UFO or something. People don't believe you. So they asked him, he said, why do you say you're mad? Why do you say you're insane? And he explained to them what he saw, a four division army entering a lotus stock uh, in the pond. And they said, yeah, you're right. You are mad. You know, you are insane. 
because what you saw does not exist at all. So you try telling telling people you saw UFO or aliens, there's you know people are going to bound to think that uh, you're out of your mind. So the Buddha used this as a to to explain. He says now because what that man saw was actually real, it wasn't an illusion. And then the Buddha explained how the devas and asuras were arrayed for battle, and then how the devas won and the asuras trying to retreat. Um, they were frightened and they escaped by uh, entering the disappearing into the lotus stock. And even this act, although the gods had power when the asuras did this, the gods themselves were were, were perplexed. They had they were bewildered. They had never seen such a thing before. So even the gods were surprised. So how could they do it? Well, Asura, they, apparently the king, the Asura king Vipachiti had a very special spell, uh, this magical spell that allowed him to, for, to perform magical uh, feats such as this. And interestingly enough, there was, there's another sutra where Lord Chakra tries to uh, not fool King Vepachiti, but try to convince King Vepachiti to teach him uh, this spell. Yeah, but then all the Asuras said, no, you cannot teach him this spell because if you do, we are, you know, we are definitely doomed for sure. So uh, Lord Chakra never found out uh, what this spell was. Okay, coming back to this sutra. So Buddha says, therefore, bhikkhus, do not think about the world thinking the world is eternal or the world is not eternal or the world is finite or infinite, the soul and the body are the same or the soul is separate from the body or the Tathagata exists after death or does not exist after death or both exist or does not exist after death or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. So this is similar to, was it Ron, your question about Guan Yin, how if Guan Yin uh, used to be a Buddha now that there's Guan Yin, what has happened to the to the other Buddha? So that question, Ron, uh, although it's very interesting, falls into this category where the Buddha says, false thinking, she would say, false thinking. Okay, what is, so what is this? What is the Buddha describing? This is how people, human beings, being human beings, we make up. I lost, I lost connection with you, Roshan. Yeah, uh, I suddenly the message just popped up on my screen and it says the meeting has been ended by the host. I had to re, I restarted the zoom, I, I restarted the zoom link. Yeah, so sorry everyone, uh, suddenly what happened was I was just, a, I'm just as surprised as everyone because the message flashed on my screen saying that the meeting has been ended by the host. Uh, I'm the host and I'm not sure, uh, I, I wasn't even touching anything at that time. Yeah, so sorry about that. Um, okay, where was I? Okay, so, so what is the Buddha cautioning us against? This is the, the tendency of the mind and its false thinking Okay, hold on, let me mute someone. Okay, this is the tendency of the mind in our uh, of false thinking where we like to think about what's happening in the world. You know, um, for example, sometimes we read reports about um, uh, the, how, how you say, people conjecture about, say, the size of the universe. Is there a limit to the universe? How many galaxies are there in the universe? Are there planets that support uh, alien life? Or oh, people think about is life real or is it actually uh, a, a simulation, for example? Or people wonder about consciousness and the soul and what is this that is actually happening or not? All that is what the Buddha is trying to get at. All these theories and views about our existence. Okay. And then the Buddha says, why should we not do that? It says, because, because this thinking is unbeneficial, irrelevant to the fundamentals of the holy celibate life and does not lead to revulsion, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to divine knowledge, 
to enlightenment, to Nibbana. So the Buddha is saying, while you can think and ponder all you want, you know, you can spend your whole life, every waking moment, thinking about the way the world is. You can come up with theories, questions. You can become world famous for the way you explain what's going on in the world. The Buddha says you still, you will still die. And when you die, you will have not accomplished anything that brings you closer to birth and death. In your next life, you will still be confused and your habits of false thinking will still remain. And you will still be subject to suffering, to afflictions. You will still be controlled by your karma and bound or trapped in endless birth and death and samsara. Okay, why is this? It's because the root of false thinking is still within the five skandhas. False thinking comes from the false mind. And so trying to use the false mind to, to look for an answer out of birth and death is something you can never do. It is, say, you are sleeping and you're dreaming and you are trying to figure out what is actually going on outside of your dream. It's, it's impossible. You will never be able to find the answer within your dream. But it is not to say that false thinking is, is useless, okay? Uh, the Buddha is not saying that false thinking is useless. In fact, all our like medicine, our, our uh, inventions, our technology, uh, we have great works of philosophy, they all come from false thinking. You know, there are a lot of uh, advice on how to cope with suffering and stress that, that comes from philosophy that's, that's very, very helpful. And all of those have their roots coming from false thinking. So it's not to say that false thinking is bad, but the solution to end birth and death cannot does not come from that approach. So to end the cycle of suffering, to know what you can rely on, you have to first understand that it doesn't come from this false thinking mind. That's why in Buddhism, we have terms like uh, going against the stream or Shofu says, turn your head around is the other shore. It means to go in a different direction from the direction that we're used to. That is, um, the direction we are used to is through this false thinking mind. So it's to turn away from that. So what is the solution the Buddha gives? Buddha says, when you think because you should think this is suffering, this is the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is the four noble truths. So what the Buddha is trying to say is in effect, pay, what is the four noble truths? Pay attention to what is happening to you. Pay attention to your thoughts, your, act, your, your speech, the actions that you carry out. Are you in control? Are you actually in control of everything that you say, everything that you think and everything that you do? Or are you just going along with, by just reacting and responding to your conditions? Are you constantly searching for happiness and satisfaction? Are you aware of doing that? And are, are you aware of how long your happiness or satisfaction lasts? Or are you even aware that you, uh, how do you say, your level of happiness and satisfaction? Have we looked at life and existence and be honest and is it really great? Do we want to come back and, you know, live life like this all over again? So in essence, that's what the Fall Noble Truth is, is a very honest examination of where we are. So it brings us back into the realities of life, which is old age, sickness, death. There is happiness, of course, but it's a mix between happiness and afflictions. And how much happiness you have is not um, not really under our control, but depends on the karma that we have created before and the, the, the level of practice that we have for now. And the last one, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. That is a noble eightfold path. Yeah. Um, sorry for the interruption just now. Uh, it's, it's time. I need to go because I need to be the proctor for, for the meal offering. So what we'll do 
is we will continue uh, with this again next week. Uh, we'll pick this up, talk about the, the Four Noble Truths leading to the Noble Eightfold Path uh, next week and continue the theme of false thinking. Okay, all right, let's um, uh, dedicate merit. Okay, I'm going to invite everyone to join me putting our palms together. May every living being, our minds as one and radiant with light, share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see, how hands and hearts can find in giving unity. May our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave our grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of our endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Okay, let's do three bows to the Buddha. First bow. Second bow. Third bow. Half bow. Bowing respect to the Venerable Master. Second bow. Third bow. Half bow. Amitofo everyone, we'll see you next week. In the meantime, pay attention to your false thinking.